Hey guys, this is going to be creation and recreation part two. It's going to be a little bit longer than the first one, but there's a lot more evidence here. And again, I want to make sure that I get this down real well. So the creation of Adam and Eve, their temptation, their fall and their judgment will be cop will be uh, uh, covered in depth on this channel. It's going to take me a little bit of time. I'm trying to get through uh, the work here make sure I go over things in a, an orderly manner as best I can. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm that, that great at it, honestly, but I'm getting there. But first we need to consider several other points concerning the earth's refitting during the seven days. A, the presence of the heavens and the earth in place at Genesis 1-3 shows this is a recreation. So it wasn't just out of nothing where they, they he started jumbling this together in a seven day period, but let me get into this. As God begins to work on the earth in Genesis 1-3, earth as the heavens in which it exists is already in place, an impossibility unless this is a recreation. B, the presence of angels during the seven days shows this is a recreation. The angels are present too, shouting for joy at the reconstruction of the earth, also necessary having been created at some earlier time before the Genesis gap, an impossibility again, unless this is a recreation. And that's from Job 38, four through seven. C, God's pronounce to pronouncement of his acts as good shows this is a recreation. God, being God, creates only what is good in the first place, bringing light out of darkness, dry land out of only sea, life out of lifelessness, are all acts of bringing something good out of something not good. In other words, darkness, sea, lifelessness, those are three things, by the way, that are repeatedly mentioned in the Bible as not being good. The tehom, the deep, is actually the home of the grave, the home of uh, Abraham's bosom, well, formerly Abraham's bosom, that place is empty now, but the abyss, the... The, the Tartarus, the place where uh, all the angels are being kept, it's, it's in the ocean. It's not a good thing. And, and no former civilization before our modern day civilizations uh, ever, ever uh, romanticized the ocean. They were always seeing it as something unknown and dangerous and deep and deadly. The pronouncement of the pronouncement and God saw it was good is a stamp of divine approval on the restoration of what had been originally good and now was restored to its good condition following an interval of judgment upon evil. Genesis 1, 4, also uh, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31. D, God's construction of the firmament argues as, that this is a recreation. In Genesis 1, 6 through 8, God constructs the firmament, firmament which separates the waters below from the waters above, rather, from the waters below, and calls this firmament heavens. Now, it can hardly be that we are meant to understand that prior to this construction of the firmament, the earth above which the fir this firmament is set had nowhere to exist or that light and darkness after separation or the waters prior to separation should be understood as having existence yet somehow not existing in the heavens for they can only be understood as existing within the universe. Indeed, both the heavens at large and the earth had already been created in Genesis 1.1. This interpretation is strengthened by both the fact that rather than creating the firmament from nothing, the language of Genesis 1-7 specifies that God made it from something. Therefore, since this was an act, since there was already a universe, the formation of this firmament can only be seen as an act of recreation. E. Recreation explains the appearance of age. The Genesis gap is most, the most likely explanation for the perceived contradiction between the biblical account of the seven days and the fossil record. The exact space of time between Genesis 1-1 and God's creation of the angels, or between their creation and Satan's fall, or between God's judgment on the original Eden earth and his restoration of it to uh, restoration of it in Genesis 1-2, excuse me guys, are not recorded for us anywhere in scripture and could well encompass, encompass rather untold eons of time, a commodity which is felt and measured much differently in the angelic sphere after all, because they're eternal beings, don't have bodies, don't age, etc., in addition, however, there is also the point that when God creates, he creates in mature perfection. The plants, animals, and people, Adam and Eve, created during the six days are all created in a mature status, thus giving the appearance of age. It is no great stretch to see the restored heavenly lights and reconstructed earth benefiting as well from a similar complete creation that might well give every impression of a lengthy geological history that does not in fact compromise, I'm sorry, comprise real time in our limited understanding of it. Here's Hebrews 11, 3. By faith, we understand that the ages have been constructed by the word of God so that what we see, in other words, the material world has not come into being from things we now see. So we can't just assume everything just slowly grew into itself like they like to say stars are and so on. 
or that the, anyway, I'm going to keep going. Second Peter 3, 5 through 7. But it escapes their notice in asserting this, namely that there were heavens long ago too, and an earth which was re-established from, from out from underwater, in other words, the waters below, and through the midst of the water, in other words, the waters above, by the word of God. And that it was through these two sets of waters that the world of that time, i.e. in Noah's day, was again deluged by water from above and below and destroyed. Now this present heavens and earth have been reserved for, the, for, for fire by that same, reserved for fire by that same word of God, preserved for the day of judgment and the destruction of godless men. F. Recreation is analogous to other divine restorations. Adam's fall resulted, resulted in a curse on the earth that is analogous to, though not nearly so devastating as, the Genesis Gap Judgment, Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Nevertheless, all creation now groans in anticipation of the removal of the curse, a blessing to come at the return of Christ, which also parallels the restoration of the earth in Genesis 1, 2. See Romans 8, 19 through 22, the earth, everything groans for the 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 restoration from the Lord's return. Those are awesome verses. A few of the many other such instances of the pattern of divine judgment followed by gracious, restora gracious restoration include, one, the renewal of the earth after the flood, Genesis 8 through 9. Two, Joseph's deliverance from prison and restoration to his family, Genesis 45. Three, Israel's restore, restored to the land, Israel restored to the land after the Babylonian captivity, Ezra, Ezra 1, 1. And four, the most significant and spectacular restoration of all, the reconciliation of sinful man to God through the redemptive work of the God-man, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, see Romans 5, 6 through 11 for that. Suffice it to say that our God is a gracious God who may hold judgment in the one hand, but always has merciful restoration in the other for all who will repent and turn to him. The restoration of the devastated earth was a clear sign to Satan and his followers that their slanderous insinuations that God would be unwilling or unable to provide for reconciliation were about to be undeniably refuted. G. Recreation is focused on man as a replacement for Satan and his angels. Finally, all of God's work, God's work rather, throughout the seven days is focused on man. Day one, light out of darkness, necessary to sustain life, heat and all that stuff. Day two, atmosphere, also a necessity for life. Day three, dry land, an essential for any animal life and for man, vegetation as a source of food, materials, pleasure, etc. Day four, lights serve as signs for the ordain, ordering rather of human life in necessary increments of time. Uh, the, the whole structuring of time and the way that, that things are perceived to us. Day five, all the cosmos. Day five, other creatures enriching human life, uh, companionship, food, clothing, etc. Day six, land and animals, and livestock to support and bless the human human life, finally man. So uh, even greater blessing for these larger animals and capacity. And then of course, man is created at the end of day six. And then day seven, God's Sabbath rest designed for man's blessing and benefit. That would also be analogous to the thousand year reign of Christ. If in fact there are 7,000 years of man, see my video on 7,000 years of man. It really is an awesome thing. And this is very much pointing towards it. Notice in Genesis 1, 26 through 30, the creation of man is the culmination of God's work. The process begins with the divine conference of the Trinity announcing God's decision. Let us make man in our image according to our pattern. Verse 26. Man is then created in the image of God. Verse 27. Free will. Blessed and given rule over all the creatures of the earth. Verse 28. And provided with food. Verse 29. As are other creatures. In verse 30. The creation of man, along with the environment to support our lives in these physical bodies, is clearly the purpose and goal of the seven days of God's restorative work in the world. Only after the earth had been restored to viable conditions, man created upon it and placed in charge of it, does God conclude that all he has made is very good. Verse 31, the Hebrew word me'odth, being added only here to God's evaluations of his various acts during the seven days as good, so it's very good. Med me Even the pattern of the seven days is one that suits and reflects the subsequent history of mankind, with each day standing for one millennium, see my video on the thousand years of man, of human history, with the seventh day signifying the millennial rule of Christ. And this principle is explained in that video, and I will actually get into it a little bit deeper because these are awesome, awesome things the Bible is pointing to, even if not directly, although I consider this pretty direct. Man also argues 
for Genesis 1-2 being a process of recreation for man specifically through the God-man, Jesus Christ, is meant in no small part as a replacement for Satan and his fallen angels, the greater morning star for, P for Peter. All right, guys, this is awesome to me. This, this when I first read this, blew my mind. I was always into dinosaurs growing up, and I'm like, eh, this doesn't really make sense because you'd think that we would have some proof, some drawing, some something, because humans tend to mark down crazy large things like sphinxes and pyramids and ziggurats and so on. So anyway, I'm gonna leave this right here. Chew on this, guys. This is awesome information. Um, and I think, I think every believer can benefit from it. And we can also see that a lot of the churches today don't bother digging too hard into the Bible and they teach things that overlook so much awesomeness that this is pointing to. Let me know what you think in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, hit the bell because you may or may not be getting the heads up for these videos. Um, I have YouTube Premium, so I always get the heads up. They tend to make sure the people that pay get them. But if you don't, you're not likely to see these. So talk to you guys soon. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm going to keep going with this because this is awesome stuff. We need to know it.